We recently had an influx of new players and returning players with patch 3.18 going live, and it never failed to amaze me how many little tips and tricks we pick up playing this game. The stuff we take for granted and do automatically, you almost forget that at some point you learned that or a friend told you it. When I started writing the script for this video it was titled 30 tips and tricks for Star Citizen, then it was 40 tips, and by the time I was done it was 50 tips and tricks. Mostly this will benefit newer folks, since I don't want to skip over some of the things that are second nature to older backers. But old dogs I'm told can learn new tricks, so I'll be really happy if more experienced players even pick up one or two new bits of info. So if this all sounds good to you, grab a cup of tea while I roll the intro, and then let's get into it. So I've split this list up by type. The first section is going to be general and quality of life tips. Second of those focus more specifically on the industrial aspects of mining, salvage and trading. And third are some from the combat realm. With a little bonus at the end we've got a few medical ones to round it out. We're going to start out with tip zero though and it might be a bit too late for some of you. And that's that a starter pack is all you need to enjoy Star Citizen. Nearly every ship currently released can be bought for credits in game, so don't go headfirst down the rabbit hole if you're just starting out or thinking about it. If you are brand new, make sure to use a referral code when you sign up to get a bit of extra starter cash. Mine's the one up on screen, but if any of your mates already play, ask them for theirs. So starting really simple, interaction is everything. The F key is going to become one of your most worn out keys playing Star Set. You'll use it to call elevators, access shops, buy stuff off mannequins, and even get out of bed in the morning until you've learned about shortcuts in the next tip, that is. Holding down F opens up interaction mode, allowing you to look around and use the cursor to point at stuff, and then you just click left mouse button to trigger the interaction. But as with many things in life, shortcuts can make things a lot smoother. While I'm trying to keep things down time-wise here, there's not really enough time to go through everything, but let's try a rapid rundown of a few of the basics. On foot, when you're holding Y, you'll get out of any seat or bed. F1 brings up your Moby Glass. I accesses inventory. T activates your headlamp. 1 and 2 access your weapons. 4 accesses utility items like multi-tools and med guns. C brings out any med pens equipped. R is for reload, and holding R holsters anything in your hands. When you're in a ship, R activates flight ready mode and warms up all of your systems. I turns off and on engines, O turns on and off shields, and P turns on and off your guns. U will power down your entire ship. N raises and lowers your landing gear, K activates VTOL mode if you've got it on your ship, B activates quantum mode and spools up your quantum engine, and then holding B down again sends you on your journey, C activates cruise control, B activates scanning mode, and tablets out of ping. And I think we're going to leave it there for now. If you head into your game settings, you can find a full keyboard map that can be invaluable to you when you're getting going. Sticking on shortcuts for tip 3, keep in mind that you can bind additional ones. Personally, I like to have a hotkey available for open exterior, as it can be a lot quicker than searching around the dashboard of different ships for the button. I also tend to rebind my call ATC button, which defaults to a hold of N, to F3 as I find this is a more convenient way to request takeoff and landing. Bonus tip here, if you've just got to your ship and can't work out how to get rid of that big hangar door that's blocking your way, just call ATC and they'll get you moving on. The interaction wheel can help you see a variety of actions that your character can do. Just hold F and press right mouse button to bring this up. And one of the best things to find here is the remove helmet command, which can just make it quicker to get your headgear off so you can eat and drink. Just remember to put your helmet back on before you head out into a hard vacuum. Okay, so when it comes to understanding your ship HUD, we're not going to be able to go into every granular detail at this point. But I'm aiming to just give you a head start on the game with these tips. Ships vary, but the HUDs are largely the same, and here we've got a few key things to pick out. 
Moving from left to right, we've got the speedo, which will show your current velocity. The square box on the right of it is your speed limiter, and the little hat next to it indicates cruise control is on. In the middle, we've got the pitch meter, which will appear when in Atmo, and on the right, we've got the altimeter, which shows your current altitude. You've also on the far right got a readout for your weapons and their ammo count, and down the bottom right corner, you've got your fuel gauges. If you make a turn, you'll see the vector indicator appear. And this indicates the direction you are currently traveling in, and over time, you would expect it to realign with your crosshairs. Many, many things in SE are controlled through your Moby Glass. You can access this by pressing F1, and the home screen will include a bunch of info, including things like your bank balance. The Moby Glass includes the Star Map app for navigating around the system, and you can jump straight to here with F2 and the comms app where you can add a few friends and set up parties. Hop straight here by pressing F11. The Moby Glass also includes apps for finding missions, kitting out your ships, keeping track of your items, and monitoring your reputation with various factions. You can see all of this by clicking on the buttons along the bottom of the screen. Quantum travel is your fast ticket around Stanton, eating up the vast distances involved in the game. Keep in mind that if you're more than 20 to 30 kilometers away from something and it has a QT marker, you can jump to it. It's not just for massive journeys, it can also just speed up those small ones. You'll notice a variety of quantum markers depending on what you're looking at. The badge type icon here represents a major landing zone. Hexagons are other ground locations on planets and moons like outposts. And whenever either of these two have a dotted outline rather than a solid one, they're on the other side of the planet to you. In space, squares are space stations. Circles are planets or moons. And diamonds are Lagrange points and OM points. OM points or orbital markers are used to navigate around planets and moons. Keep in mind that OM1 is always the north pole at the top of the planet, while OM2 is always the south pole at the bottom. When you start in SC, you're going to spawn at one of the major landing zones, Lawville, New Babbage, Orison, or Area 18. Getting out of these and into space can take quite a bit of time, so as soon as you can, you're going to want to set your spawn at one of the space stations in case, you know, you die in a ball of flames. Lawville, New Bab, and Area 18 have a fully equipped low orbital station right above the major LZ, so you can go to this and find the clinic. And here you'll just need to access the insurance terminals and update your spawn info. Horizon is a bit different in that its low orbital Port Olisar doesn't have a clinic. Either head to Grim Hex, which is near the moon of Yella, or to the refinery station at Crew L1, which you can set your spawn at as well. MFDs or multifunctional displays in your ships are not just for show. You can get a lot of extra info and control elements of your ship through them. Hold F for interaction, and look at the display. Bonus tip here, if you press middle mouse button while you're looking at a display, you'll focus steadily on it. You can then access the different apps on the displays via the menu, and this can help in setting up the displays that you want to see in your peripheral vision. When you're starting out, missions can be a great way to get going. Access your Moby Glass with F1, and navigate to the Contract Manager tab for a bunch of options. My advice is to not skip over some of the simple ones like box deliveries when you're new, as they can give you a heap of experience navigating and flying your ship around without the additional pressure of getting shot at. Sticking in the contract manager for the time being, if you need a reminder of the mission that you're on, you can head to the accepted tab at the top, and here you can see the details and you can also see the options down at the bottom to track, untrack, and if need be abandon the mission. Sometimes if you don't see the details of a mission pop up, it's because it isn't tracked, so check before giving up. You can also share these missions if you're in a party, so if you can get a mission, you can deal it out to your friends. If you're looking to get the most out of your ship, you're going to want to get accustomed to the power triangle. And this controls your ship's capacitors, routing power between your three major systems, weapons, shields and thrusters. By default, your power will be split a third, a third, a third, you can divert power to favour one system over the others. With more power to weapons, your energy guns will have more shots before recharging, and will recharge quicker. More power to shields will help them regenerate faster, and more power to thrusters will increase the speed at which your afterburner or boost recharges. 
By default, you can send more power to weapons with F5, thrusters with F6, and shields with F7. F8 resets. But something I've found that makes managing the power triangle much, much easier is rebinding the controls and setting shortcut keys for max 2. The default controls step in increments, but in most situations you're going to want to throw your power behind one system situationally. On keyboard, I have max guns on 1, max boosts on 2, and max shields on 3. Then I've moved the reset key to 4. This just keeps them in easy reach when you're moving around. Starset has some basic survival mechanics, not overly onerous, but you will have to keep your character fed and watered. My advice? Get used to the sweet sweet taste of cruise. This beverage can be bought at many of Stanton's shops or looted from the grey chests at nearly every outpost. Cruise refills both food and drink meters simultaneously, just don't ask too many questions about what they put in it. Sticking with managing your food and drink, keep in mind that you can always refill both of your meters in a med bed. I call this the intravenous burrito method. Just check into any clinic or use a med bed aboard any of the ships that have them to refill those bars. Number 15 is one I only learned myself recently. You can grab items off the floor when you're in inventory mode, which can make scooping them up a lot easier. This is particularly useful if your mate has just chucked a set of armor down for you, since you can go into inventory mode when you stood next to it, sweep it off the floor into a local inventory, and then instantly pop it onto your character far quicker than picking up each individual item and equipping it. Regardless of what you're doing, always carry a med pen or four. They're cheap as chips and can even be equipped to an undersuit. At some point you will be going about your day, and either through a game breaking bug or a mental slip or a friend with a itchy trigger finger, you will all of a sudden take damage and find yourself bleeding out. If you've got your med pen, no problem. Just press C to pull it into your hands and press left mouse button to jab yourself. But if you ignored this tip, you might well be facing a spawn back wherever you last set it, a claim of your ship and a potentially lengthy journey to resume your adventure. Many of these tips are centered around saving you a bit of time. SC is brilliant because of its size and scale, but this can also be a hindrance. Getting to a certain location might have taken you a decent chunk of your evening, so don't throw that time away for lack of a 100 credit med pen. And this feeds into my next tip. Work out your basic kit and stock up on a few sets of it once you've got the bank balance that allows a little splurge. Personally, I default to an aerial armor, and I like to roll out equipped wherever I'm going, since you never quite know when you're off to back up a friend. As well as my armor, I've always got my med pens, a med gun, a pyro multi-tool with tractor beam attachment, my sidearm, and a P4 assault rifle. I'm not saying this is what you must carry, I'm just trying to encourage you to know what you like to have on you. At most of the locations I base myself regularly, I have four or five sets of this kit. When bad, fiery, explodey things happen, and they will, chances are you won't be wanting to run around all the shops to put your kit back together. You'll be wanting to head back out to try and recover your supplies and or your dignity. So having backup sets can really save you that time and effort. Treading carefully is particularly key when moving around in confined spaces like elevators and ship interiors. When you're in proximity to other players, desync can make you collide even when it doesn't look like it on your screen. And if you go sprinting into an elevator, it can have lethal consequences. Control your speed on foot the same way you do in a ship with the mouse wheel. Just scroll down to move slower and you'll eventually go to a walking speed. Number 19 is a nice easy one, but when landing a ship, try to build in the habit of shutting off your engine. Remember that I shortcut here to make it quick. This can reduce the amount of times you recall your ship to find it floating up in the air of the hangar. The tractor beam tool has many uses and to my mind should be in everyone's everyday kit. But one of its really cool features is an EVA grappling hook. You can move yourself around in space okay with your suit thrusters, but it can be slow going and a tractor beam can help you latch onto things like ships and pull yourself along, greatly enhancing your speed and control in EVA. A really simple one for 21, but a lot of people don't know, hold alt and press X to wipe your visor. Great for enjoying a snowy day out in Microtech. Unfortunately, there's no equivalent just yet for ship windscreens. 
So you might have wondered how people get some of the amazing screenshots they do with all sorts of points of view. And the answer is advanced camera controls. Enter third person by pressing F4. And now if you hold F4 as a modifier, you can use a combination of the arrow keys, your free look button on Z and mouse movements, page up and page down to reorient the camera. And with a bit of practice, you can find really good angles for better views and sweet, sweet screenshot material. For even more style points though, you can activate the missile chase camera by assigning it a key in the control mapping. This will allow you to follow the haywire flight of one of your rockets right up until the point it slaps the hull of an enemy ship. Even if you are a stand-up citizen, you're at some point going to find yourself on the wrong side of the law. Keep in mind that as of 3.18, crime stats 1 and 2 don't ultimately designate you as kill on site. You can go ahead and pay these off if you wish at any of the fine terminals that you find at the major LZs on the way to the spaceport or next to the admin kiosks at the gallery decks of most space stations. CS3 and above is going to mean you're likely looking at some time in the slammer though. Of course you can choose to run the risk of getting caught trying to clear your crime stat at SBK, but that's a whole different video in itself. Or, if you're looking for good citizen points, you can use the same fine terminals to surrender to authorities and get some time off your sentence. Keep in mind that with a CS3 or above, most space stations are going to be weapons free and will probably make a mess of you before you land. You can always head to Grimhex though, Stanton's haven for criminals, and use the terminal there to surrender should you be so inclined. As I've mentioned in earlier tips, time is key in SC, and distances are huge. So when you've got the wallet to support it, investing in a daily driver that can take a size 2 drive and an XL1 QT drive is going to be a huge quality of life improvement. My personal favourite daily driver is the Drake Cutlass Black, and at a little under 1.4 million credits to buy in game, this is the cheapest ship with a size 2 drive. And just for context, the journey from Art Corp to Microtech in a cutty with an XL1 will take you 4 minutes and 29 seconds while the same journey in a stock Aurora will take 8 minutes and 44 seconds. Add up all the time that you spend QTing places, and this becomes a worthy target for anyone starting out. And finally, for our general and quality of life section, Star Citizen is a good game solo, but it becomes an entirely different beast when you play with other people. One of the reasons I enjoy Star Citizen so much is because, for an MMO, it takes the multiplayer aspect of the acronym seriously. Don't be afraid to reach out to people in global chat and ask if anyone's looking to party up. And since you're halfway through this vid, I hope you don't mind me making a little plug. You are always welcome to swing by our Discord, and if you're looking for people to fly with, we'll get you in the seat. The link is just down in the video description below. Our next section of tips and tricks is go cover some of the more industrial side of SC. Things like mining, salvage and trading. The type of activities that are more economically motivated and first up in this area of the list is to have the right tools for the job. Mining and salvage are all about locating resources out in the wild, on the moons and in the asteroid fields dotted around Stanton, but you need to know from the start what you can and can't extract with your choice of tools. First up we've got gem nodes and these come in two sizes. The first at around 0.1 mass are designed to be cracked apart and harvested with the mining attachment of the pyro multi-tool. At 0.7 to 0.8 mass you're meant to use a grey cat rock mining buggy. And there is currently three types of gems, soon to be four with 319. Adenite is purplish and the most valuable, Aphrodite has a blue colour and is the middle value, while Dolvine is green and is the least valuable. Gems can all be sold at the various admin offices of space stations, major landing zones, and at any of the mining outposts. Up next we've got ore deposits which can be found in asteroids in space and in rocks on the surfaces of moons and planets. These both use the same icon. They can be mined with two ships, the MISC Prospector and the multi-crew Argo Mole. Ore deposits can contain a variety of materials, the most valuable of which is Quantanium. And finally, salvage comes as either derelict hulls or as panels which can be found in the asteroid fields and around Lagrange points, or in the Aran Halo. We've got a bit more on the Halo in a bit later. These can be harvested using the Drake Vulture or the Aegis Reclaimer. So now that you know what you could find, it's good to know a neat trick for knowing what you're looking at from a distance. We can use the RS signature within scanning mode to identify certain items. 
First let out a ping, then open up scanning mode with V, and look at the return box. RS SIG will come up on the left hand side of the screen. If the number you're looking at is a multiple of 1700, it's rocks or asteroids. A multiple of 2000 is salvage panels, and a multiple of 620 is gems. So using this data you can avoid having to, tra to travel to look at every single return, and limit further inspection to the things you're set up to tackle. The Aran Halo is an asteroid belt ringing the Stanton Star between the planets of Artcorp and Crusader. It contains a vast amount of asteroids as well as salvageable derelicts and panels. And due to its size and the manner in which you reach it, it's one of the safest locations to mine or salvage in the system. To reach the Halo you'll need to drop out a quantum travel at a certain distance between two points. Thankfully the folks over at Cornerstone have mapped routes from every refinery station. Simply head towards the target station, then at the designated distance in the map, hold down B again to cancel your quantum travel and you'll find yourself in the asteroid field. I've included links to Cornerstone's site just down in the video description. This tip applies to all types of industrial players, because whenever you're hauling valuables, make sure to add a dogleg jump to reduce your predictability. The RSI Mantis is a ship that's used by pirates to snare haulers and pull them out of QT travel, and hold them up in dead space. This way they're away from the prying eyes of law enforcement, don't get crime stats, and can take their time taking your ship. You can greatly reduce the threat of interdiction by adding a simple variance to your journey. I've just loaded my ship up with goods, and I want to head to Orison on Crusader to sell. But rather than plotting a course directly from where I am in Hurston to Crusader and putting myself on a predictable route, I set course for a completely different location first. Ideally this is something like an out of the way Lagrange point where I wouldn't be expected to travel. Once I've travelled a little bit of the way, I cut my drive and I set course for Crusader. I'm now way off the predictable trade line and any pirates lying in wait are going to miss me. For the miners out there, keep in mind that the absolute most important part of a mining build is the laser or mining head. I'd argue a close second is an upgraded QT drive, but the mining head is certainly number one. You will not get far at all with the stock arbor laser found on the prospector and mole. The most useful head by far is a lancet which provides significant buffs for resistance and instability. A quick bonus tip here is to beware the rental prospector, it's basically a credit trap. You can't change out any of the parts on rental ships, so in the rental prospector you're going to be stuck with the Arbor Laser. There's a big range of mining modules and gadgets in SC, but they're all here to help you break rocks more easily. Modules come in two varieties, permanent mods which are always on when attached to your laser, and consumables which are activated by holding alt and pressing the corresponding key of 1, 2 and 3. These have 5 charges and once they're gone they're gone. Gadgets are a little more finicky, you need to physically leave your ship and place these onto rocks, then attune them to above a 90% level before activating them and gaining the buffs. Along with the mining laser tip, I would recommend you maybe check out some of my other videos for the finer details of exactly what all of these do, and which ones I recommend, but for now it's good enough that you know these exist and what the general idea of them is. I have an entire Quantanium mining guide that to be fair is in itself over an hour long, and I don't think on this whistle stop tour I'm going to be able to cover all of the finer details, but this is probably my number one tip for quant mining. Break and scan all of the rocks before you scoop anything, particularly in a prospector. Once you scoop a single gram of quant, you're on a 15 minute timer before things get explosive, so in order to leave yourself the maximum time to get back to the refinery, Make sure you don't have any more cracking to do after you've scooped the first bit. This will help you prioritise the best pieces of quant and ensure you get as much as possible back. There are plentiful mining calculators out there which will allow you to tap the mass of the rock and the percentage of the material into it and get an exact SCU conversion. I actually recommend my friend Star Destroyers over at XSC Org Tools. However, we don't want to spend all of our time alt-tabbing if we can help it. The simple maths is that approximately 100 mass equals 2 SEU. And one of the reasons asteroids are great is they're all around 5000 mass. So in asteroids the percentage of a certain material roughly translates to the SEU inside. In effect, a 35% quant asteroid 
would most likely have around about 35 SCU of Quantanium in it. When mining ores, you can choose to sell your haul directly to the refinery at the ore sales terminal, or you can refine it at these kiosks to turn it into more valuable processed goods. You'll then need a cargo ship to haul these goods to a TDD at a major landing zone, but the finished product is worth roughly double the unrefined ore. However, at the refinery terminals you'll be confronted by a number of refining processes. Each one is essentially a trade-off between yield, speed and cost. My advice is to always prioritise getting a high yield above all else, and that cuts us down to three processes that offer you 95%. We can discount pyrometric chromalysis because the cost is so high, which leaves ferrin exchange and dinic solventation. I tend to use dinix most of the time since I'm not too worried about when I get my money. I do dip into using ferrin because it's not too much more expensive, and when I have crewmates to give a share to, I like to get them paid a bit quicker. Salvage lasers and modules work a little differently to their mining equivalents. In salvage, there's only one laser type, the Bayer, which comes in a size 1 version on the Vulture and size 2 on the Reclaimer. The laser can have two of the three available modules attached which will determine the area you're stripping hull from, the rate of extraction and the efficiency. We're still in early days on hull stripping, but personally I think the Abraid is in most circumstances the strongest module. The trawler has its uses, but the cinch is a bit of a value trap, where the added efficiency doesn't compensate enough for the very low speed. You'll notice from my chart that each mod has two numbers for speed and efficiency. And this is because depending on whether the laser is a size 1 or 2, you'll get different results, with the Reclaimer's size 2 lasers being faster and more efficient than the Vulture's size 1s. While the Vulture isn't as quick or efficient as the Reclaimer, it does benefit from being a much more nimble ship able to get around a piece of salvage more easily. For extra control and economy of movement, use the Vulture's gimbals by pressing G when in salvage mode. This will let you more smoothly navigate the piece and helps you stay still while stripping. And this in turn can be very helpful if you're being unloaded by a cargo ship while you salvage. So this tip is more of a workaround currently since the claimer's elevator keeps breaking, and I wasn't going to include many workarounds in the list because of its longevity as bugs get fixed. But even if the elevator works in the future, I think this will still be useful for getting instantly into the salvage processing deck. The Reclaimer has a rear hatch on its back underside that can be opened from the pilot's chair by pressing the open exterior button on the dash, or using that keybind you did earlier. You can then gain entry from outside as long as you have a tractor beam to give yourself a speed boost. Aim for the roof just inside and pull yourself in. A little jump at the end will help you land with a flourish. The pilot can then close the exterior to lower this little elevator, and opening it once more will raise the elevator so you can access the salvage processing deck and the stations themselves. I'd get the pilot to hit close exterior one last time so you don't get any stowaways. When trading, it's important to understand server ticks and rates of refresh in relation to inventories. Every trade kiosk in Stanton will buy and sell a finite amount of a certain commodity. They all have a max inventory, and once this is exhausted, it will refill at a certain rate once per server tick. That's roughly every 5 to 10 minutes or so. It's generally better not to wait out server ticks trying to fill your ship with a super valuable commodity like Laronite. Instead, take what you can of the highest value stuff, then fill up your ship if you can afford it on the lower value stuff so you can get going. When you're on the ground, you're at your most vulnerable in a trade run. Keep in mind that inventories are shared across servers, so even if you can't see anyone else around you at a certain kiosk, that's not to say there isn't someone else, or multiple someone else's, stood on exactly the same spot as you waiting for the same tick on other shards. And even if you're running solo, try to have at least one friend on the server with you. This way if you crash with a full ship, you can join back on them and you'll most likely come back into your seat with your haul intact. And finally for trading, and also for industry more generally, don't bet your whole wallet on a run. Trading comes with an element of risk in that you bear the cost of the cargo, from the point you put it into your ship to the point where you sell up. It can be tempting to cram your ship with as much of the highest value commodities as you can, but keep in mind that if something goes wrong, you're going to want to leave yourself with startup capital to get back up and running. So now we're out of the industry section and into the pew pew section. And first in our combat tips is to know your weapon types. 
there are a ton of guns that you can slap on your ship, but they can be classified in two main ways. First up, we've got the type of damage that they do. I'm going to get out my Anvil Hornet here so I can strap as many different types of guns onto it as possible. Energy Weapons covers two types of damage, Laser and Distortion, but they share common features. They rely on your ship for power, so are affected by the power triangle, and while they have a limited magazine of shots, they will recharge over time. Laser Weapons do damage to shields and the hull of enemy ships once the shields are depleted, Distortion weapons will typically do more damage to shields, but after they're down will not actually take hull points off an enemy ship. Instead, distortion damage then works to fry and shut down components. You can never outright kill a target with distortion weapons alone. Ballistics are the other side of the coin. These guns fire solid shot ammunition and benefit from higher average DPS along with a percentage chance to ignore shields and pass through straight to damage the hull. The downside though is that once the ammo is gone, it's gone. You'll need to return to a space station to get some more. Once you've established the damage type, there's also weapon type, which can be largely broken down into four broad categories. There are a few borderline cases, but generally you're going to find Gatlings, which have a very high rate of fire, Repeaters, which have a decent balance between rate of fire and DPS, Cannons, which have a slow rate of fire but higher alpha or single shot damage, than equivalent repeaters, and scatter guns, effectively shotguns on a spaceship. These are very high DPS, but slow firing and very close ranged. With the exception of Gatlings, which are exclusively ballistic, you'll find all kinds of damage types in combination with these weapon types. So when you put the two together, you get the overall picture. Laser repeaters, ballistic cannons, distortion scatter guns, and so on. Once you've got someone targeted by pressing T, you'll get the PIP or targeting reticule. This is your ship effectively telling you where to shoot in order to hit the moving target. But by default this is going to be leading PIP, and you might also want to experiment with lagging PIP. You can assign a key binding to switch between the two PIP types in vehicles weapons. Rather than showing you where to shoot, a lagging PIP will show you where your shots are going to land if you shoot where your crosshair is. Lagging pip can be particularly useful when you're fighting bigger ships and want to focus your fire on a specific region of them. Bonus tip here, if you do want to clear a target rather than shooting at it, just hold alt and press T again. This one's really simple. Nothing kills you quicker in ship combat than zoning out and staying stationary. I know when you start out there's going to be a lot going on, but keep moving when you're in combat. The flip side of that is don't go too fast. Zipping around, you're not necessarily going to have the accuracy to hit anything. This one might sound obvious, but spaceship combat is pretty high paced. And you need to keep in mind, even with laser weapons that regenerate ammo over time, that you've got a limited magazine of shots each time that depletes a lot faster than you might like. So focus on your aim precision and try to get into the habit of firing only when you've got a really good chance of hitting. Moving over to the FPS side of combat, you can use underbarrel attachments by pressing U on your keyboard. You can attach a few useful bits of kit like flashlights and laser pointers. If you're into looking after the pennies, then there is plenty of free armor with one careless owner to be had in bunkers. I would strongly encourage you to prioritize looting guards over bad guys. Party markers don't work perfectly, so to avoid getting shot by your mates or other players who might arrive to do a bunker as you're leaving, don't look like a bad guy. Okay, so this one could really be under a separate loot goblin tab, but if you're looking to stock up on armor, weapons and other goodies from bunkers and caves, consider making yourself a 2 SEU box to save yourself some trips back and forth. For this you'll need a small vehicle with an inventory big enough to fit a Pembroke or Novikov armor. These all-in-one Michelin man suits are too big to fit inside a one SCU box, and that's the key. I'm going to use my Pisces. So stick this into the inventory of your small ship. Then fly out of the armistice zone. Now blow up the ship with another ship. And voila, a two SCU box will appear to hold that armor piece that was in the inventory. If you want to do like I did and get two boxes, you'll need three pieces of the Novikov or Pembroke. These boxes can be tractor beamed around, so you can take them with you into a bunker and fill them up inside. And they even fit neatly into a number of vehicles, including the base cyclone, for when you have to drive to targets. 
and for our last view we're going to look at a few medical tips here. So armistice zones will prevent you from using your medical gun. So if you've got a friend in need who's got themselves into a bit of an accident while inside, you won't be able to use your med gun to res them. But fear not because you remembered tip number 15 and are always carrying med pens. And these can be used inside and outside of armistice to revive other players. Just get your med pen out with C and then click right mouse button to give them the jab, not yourself. Please don't, outside of Armistice, get confused like I have in the past and click middle mouse button. John John still hasn't let me forget that one. If one of your buddies or a potential rescue target is down in a dangerous position like during a bunker mission, use your tractor beam to move them to safety before reviving them. This way you'll be able to stay out of the firing lines of whoever it was who capped them in the first place. And as the rescuer, you won't be needing a rescue yourself. And this last tip is going to maybe be obvious for a number of you, but it's surprising how many people I see who are unsure on the whole medbed thing, so for the newer players out there I'm going to clear it up pretty quickly. When you take damage there is a chance you might incur an injury, and these are scaled from 3, the least severe, to 1, the most severe. Medical beds follow the same scale, with tier 3 beds on smaller medical ships like the Pisces C8R and Cutlass Red, tier 2s on the larger Karakin 890 Jump, and at some point in the future the 600i once it has a rework, and tier 1 beds which are currently only found at the medical clinics on space stations and hospitals at major LZs. Tier 1 injuries can only be treated at tier 1 beds, but tier 1 beds can cure all injuries, including the tiers 2 and 3. For a bonus tip at major landing zones, it can be quite a hike to hospital. So particularly if you've picked up an injury that's crippling your movement, you're going to want to look at these medical elevators in the hangars. A friend can push the button from the outside to send you straight to the hospital rather than having you walk. So I really hope you enjoyed my 50 tips for Star Citizen, but let's sneak in tip 51, and that's always remember to have fun. Particularly with a new patch, and even more if you're a new player, you can get the blinkers on a bit and set out to do whatever you can to min-max and make as many credits as you can. So you can fly all the shiny ships and pew pew the shiny guns. I'm not knocking you, I very much was you. But my advice now would be don't be in such a rush to try and reach the destination that you miss out on the ride. Try out a bit of everything the game has to offer and most of all enjoy yourself. I hope these tips and tricks are going to help you get to grips with a game that at times can be frustrating and seemingly locked behind a very steep learning curve. Because just speaking from my own perspective, despite all of this, I've never had more fun or more laughs in a video game. If you enjoyed the vid and think I've earned it, then please drop a like and hit subscribe to keep up with more content. And if you could share it with a friend, an org mate, or your auntie who's taken her first steps in SC, that does really help me out. I also do have a Patreon if you'd like to help fund my burrito habit, but honestly just by watching the channel you're already doing more than enough. I'd also like to say a huge thank you to my friends over at Frontier Consolidated, in particular John John, Ravnak and Sila, who stuck with me through making this video. It was an awful lot of b-roll to go out there and put together. And be sure to drop a comment down below with any of your tips and tricks. The SE community is incredibly good at helping each other out and sharing the things that we learn. And frankly, I expect I'll be able to make 15 more tips and tricks for Star Citizen before too long with a little bit of help. So with all that said, thanks very much for watching all the way to the end, and I look forward to seeing you next time.